Recently, I was looking for a good hardware and for guide to recommend to people, and found that most of the current ones are overly complicated or really outdated. As such, I have decided to work on a tutorial series for vanilla Hearts of Iron 4. There is a pretty significant skill barrier that makes a lot of people not play these fantastic games. I know I have tried to get friends into Paradox games before, and immediately get told it's too complicated and intimidating, which is fair. This is an attempt to provide an up-to-date resource for Hoi4 players, both new and old alike, for the Buy Blood Alone update. I'm Hemrabe, let's get going. Hearts of Iron 4 is by nature a war game. Paradox titles tend to focus more on grand strategy broadly speaking, but when playing Hoi 4, remember this game is pretty much all about war. If you are playing it for any other reason, it is still important to remember. In the first part of this tutorial series, we will cover the politics of Hoi 4. This component is very lacking in many ways, and it's mostly built around your focus trees. It is important to note that there is a hugely lopsided advantage to monarchies, communism, and fascism, which is grossly unrealistic. However, unavoidable due to game mechanics and the lack of any proper economic system. I also want to briefly note, this is a guide for vanilla Hearts of Iron 4, but the best of this game is in the amazing mods the community have made. Once you understand vanilla, I advise you play mods rather than the base game. Let's get going. All actions in strategy games are usually based off of point systems. In Hearts of Iron 4, the main thing you will use is political power. Political power is gained through a base amount of 2 for every country, and gets additional bonuses through percentage increases from focuses, decisions, leaders, and advisors. Political power is used to appoint advisors, change national laws, choose decisions, and make diplomatic actions. Generally, this is one of the core mechanics in Hoi 4, and should always be prioritized. They should be taken before pretty much anything else in your focus tree, and for advisors that give you some. Every country has national spirits or modifiers, which oftentimes include huge bonuses or debuffs, and a fair amount of flavor. When you start a new country, click on your flag at the top left, and right below your active focus you will see them. It is best to always look these over at the start of an early game, as they can be incredibly important to understand for which focuses you need to go for first, and what major problems or advantages you should make use of. The only way you remove these is to get more is through the national focus tree. Do note, some are impossible to remove and are simply a part of playing your country. Politics in Hoi 4 is pretty much all based around the focuses of your country. Most countries have a unique focus tree, but some will have the generic focus tree which is the same as all the others. Most trees are similar in general design and composition, which are branches relating to political parties and changes, economics and building, and the military. You will have to play mods if you want anything outside of this template for the most part. Almost all focuses take 70 days of in-game time to complete, though some trees will have shorter 35-day focuses, as well as 140 for some of the much bigger ones. It is worth noting that when a focus ends, you do not need to immediately choose a replacement, as the game will store a little bit of time that will automatically go when you choose the next one, though it is best to pick as soon as you possibly can. Focus trees are what you will base a lot of your game around in terms of direction, motivation, and bonuses. Do note, not every tree is made equally. Some, like Mexico or Poland, have really fun, fantastically made focus trees, while others, like the US or Romania, will be found very lacking. In the base game of Hearts of Iron 4, there are only four groupings ideologically. They vary based on party, but the core breakdown of political ethics is very simple and simplified. The groupings are always within democratic, communism, fascist, and non-aligned ideologies. The first three are very straightforward and well known due to their prominence in this era. Non-aligned is more or less an um umbrella ideology that covers anything that doesn't fit into these three, and can include monarchism, dictatorships, autocracies, or anything else you can think of. When you play a game of Hoi 4, you will most likely have a political ideology you want to play in mind. To get the group you wish into power, you must find ways to get support for the party that represents your chosen ideology. To do this, you'll need to get daily change, which can primarily be gotten through your focus tree. As I mentioned before, your focus tree will have a political portion, which should include a focus that gives daily change to these specific parties. In addition, you can also get this from political advisors, though not every country has them. Your decisions menu will have a few things you can do to change your political structure. 
When you have received enough support for the party you are trying to change over time, you will receive decisions to open up a peaceful process to hold a referendum to get the other party into power. You can also normally start a civil war, but this is incredibly costly in terms of manpower and equipment, and will put you back a lot, assuming you even win. You also have the ability to cause raids of opposing political parties in your decision menu. This will reduce the chosen party's power significantly, and temporarily reduce your stability. As such, an action is of course very controversial. Batting opposing parties does the same, so they will need to not have a lot of support and should permanently end their power in your country. Interacting with other countries is an important aspect of any game, whether you are map painting or role playing an isolationist nation. To open up the diplomatic window with another country, simply write any part of them on the map. I will go over each diplomatic action here and how they can and should be utilized. Declaring war is very straightforward. In order to be able to use this, you must have a valid Cassus Belly on the other country. These are obtained either through your focus tree or through justifying a war goal. This brings us to the next one, which is how you are able to get into a war. To justify a war goal on another country, you must be able to pay the political power cost associated, and then wait the appropriate time. This is normally around half a year, but can be a little more or less depending on your bonuses. It's important to note that your ability to justify war goals is dependent on your ideology. Democracies are unable to simply justify a war goal. In order for them to do so, the country they wish to justify on will need to have caused world tension. This is a mechanic we will get into more later. But to put it simply, they need to have invaded another country, justified a war goal themselves, or something along those lines. Democracies are also completely unable to justify on other democracies. Communists and fascists have no limits on justification. In fact, if you are already in a war of a major power, fascists specifically, you'll be able to justify 80% faster. For non-aligned countries, there is a requirement of 50% global world tension to be able to justify wars. Guaranteeing independence is a tool that allows you to promise to fight alongside another country if they are attacked. This is useful if you know another country is going to war and the country you plan on guaranteeing and you wish to be involved in that war. Or if you are role playing your game, it often makes sense to guarantee countries in your sphere, who you watch over, or for other reasons. You are only able to guarantee another country if they are the same ideology as you and the level of world tension requirement is met. Asking for and giving military access is very straightforward. You are able to move troops through another nation's borders if they accept, or another country yours. This is useful if you plan to go to war together and want troops placed in a friendly nation's borders before a war. Docking rights function in the same way, and is potentially even more useful. Having an example, docking rights with Great Britain as the US prior to entering a European conflict and being able to station your navy in Gibraltar so as to strike the Italian fleet as soon as the war begins. This is incredibly useful and could even decide the war prematurely. All these are free and cost no political power, so definitely make use of them. Improving relations is a very important but costly tool. Many other diplomatic options, as well as many focuses, decisions, or inviting nations to your faction are based on other countries' opinions of you. This can be seen by opening the diplomatic menu by right-clicking them, and then the political menu looking at the opinion score lower down. By improving relations with a country, you will pay 10 political power, which is cheap, but in addition, 0.2 political power every day. This doesn't seem like a lot, but if you did it for a year, that's 75 pp. I advise only doing this if you need a certain opinion for your focus tree, or if you're role-playing, of course. Sitting attaches, we will cover properly in the military tutorial, but to put it simply, this allows you to send someone to a country at war to observe things as they progress. Having them there allows you to learn from the war, and thus give you XP over time, which is very useful. It also gives you war support, which is needed to further and mobilize, so it is often used as a cheese tactic to mobilize your economy earlier, giving many benefits. It costs 50 command power and 100 political power. The cost is high, but the benefits are often worth it. This is locked behind Waking the Tiger DLC, so do keep that in mind if you don't have it. Non-aggression packs are a great way to secure a border against an enemy, or ensure peace between a dangerous power near you. They are pretty hard to break though, so if you want to break this quickly and go to war later on, this will not be easy to do. Getting a country to accept is based off relations, so if they don't want to, hover over the X to see why. 
So usually it's just an opinion issue, so improve relations with the country for a while, and they should be willing. Creating factions we will cover properly later in this tutorial as well. By doing this, you are making a military alliance that requires you to defend them if they are attacked unless you wish to dissolve it. This is used to make power blocks in the game, as you will need allies to win wars depending on skills and the opponent. To create a faction, the other country must be of your own ideology, or have a lot of your current one in their country, even if they're not in charge. There's also a world tension requirement for many ideologies. Joining a faction and inviting other countries to your faction is based almost entirely off of opinion and ideology, so keep that in mind. Negotiating licenses, we will cover more in the military tutorial. They allow you to get a military equipment from a never friendly country that they have researched and produce it for yourself. Keep in mind it costs civilian factories to do so, and you will get a production debuff if you haven't done it yourself in research, but it is often worth it, so keep that in mind. Lend leases should be obvious given the history of World War II. They allow you to receive or send equipment to friendly or allied nations in a war. Normally, you will have deficits of certain equipment types, as will your allies, and this will allow you to deal with this. In order to receive the supplies or send them, you must either have a land border or the necessary convoys to send them. It will happen in chunks over time, depending on how much is being sent. Sending volunteers and expeditionary forces is only different in that to send an expeditionary force, you must be in the same faction as the other and can send as many divisions as you like. The other country will have complete control over them as well, whereas when you send volunteers, you keep control and just manage them yourself. Volunteers are the important ones here, as you are able to massively influence the outcomes of wars, especially in the early part of the game, which can make things much easier for you. They are also a great way to grind general XP and traits, as well as game army and air XP. Lastly, we have garrison support. When you're at war, the land your troops control does not simply accept your occupation and go drink tea. They will try to revolt and fight back. You will need to use a large portion of your equipment and manpower to garrison these occupied regions, which can be very taxing on your manpower and supplies. If you have allies in a war with you, it can be utilized to ask for some of their men to help with this problem. Major wars are almost never fought alone. Allies are needed to win major conflicts, and in order to fight together, it is necessary to share common cause and, normally, ideology. The major factions historically in World War II were the Allies and Axis, though to be fair, the Allies included the Comintern, which was kind of a separate entity. The Axis was made up of fascist countries with the goal of annexing large regions of Europe, whereas the Allies were a more democratic and non-aligned faction with the purpose of maintaining peace and global order. The Comintern was a communist organization with the goal of pushing their revolution to other countries around the world and to a lesser degree combat the Axis. A lesser known faction was the Co-Prosperity Sphere, an imperialistic group ran by Japan as they conquered Asia. The point is factions in Hoi 4 represent shared purpose and viewpoints. In order to make a faction, you must have nations with similar values. Every faction has a leader. This is the nation that creates it or starts with it initially, as the UK, Germany, and the Soviets all start as faction leaders. They are who decides who gets to be in the faction. It is possible to take this mantle from another if you are stronger. With the addition of DLC, there are many factions that can now be created. In order to create a faction, you must be able to do so from the start, or get a focus that allows you to, otherwise you can only join others. Factions are what gives you real power until you don't need anyone else to help you anymore. You are able to see everything going on and other members of the faction, and can also freely move in their borders. Intel Ledger covers a lot, so we will keep it related to politics and cover the other portions in other videos. Generally though, the Intel Ledger is where you can see all the important informations for another country. How much you can see and how accurate it is is based off of the intelligence of that nation. To access it, right-click on the country and hit the Intel tab, rather than the diplomatic one. Many of these may appear as question marks, meaning you simply don't know. The part that is politically useful is the factor count to see how strong they are, as well as the economy and trade laws found at the bottom of civilian intel. If you want to know more about a potential ally, faction member, or enemy, this is very useful. Many countries, such as the United Kingdom, start with many vassals in the beginning. They can also be gained through wars and forced subjugation. 
If you have vassals, you can manage them in the menu, which is found underneath the political section. This screen essentially shows you your level of control over your subjects. Just like real life, this varies dramatically. One subject may be almost entirely autonomous and only a vassal in name and military obligation, while others may be objectively almost part of their overlord. The manner in which this is portrayed is autonomy levels. All puppets have a level, which goes from annexed to free. Having puppets allows you to get large portions of their resources for very low cost. It also allows you to get access to their manpower, always, when available for your garrisons. A huge advantage to take note of is that you can use your puppet's templates to make divisions with their manpower and control them yourself, which we will cover in the military tutorial. In order to get a puppet, simply select a puppet option in a peace conference. Integrating a puppet and getting their level of autonomy down is dependent on getting more autonomy score. This can be gotten by lend leasing your puppet equipment and building factories or anything else in their territory. When you have gotten enough score from this, you will then have the option to change their autonomy level down. This costs political power though, and is not cheap. The most cost effective way to do this currently is lend leasing convoys. They are cheap and give a lot of autonomy, though this is pretty gamey, especially if you're giving them to say, Tenetuvu, which doesn't have any water. Stability is clear in nature. It shows how much support there is for the ruling party and the nation. Obviously more is better, and provides many benefits, while having low stability can be disastrous. The middle ground is 50%, where you get neither. Anything above this gives factory and dockyard output bonuses, consumer good reduction, and political power gain bonus. Likewise, anything below 50 gives a reduction of the same. The main way to get more stability is by having a party in power with a lot of support. For example, having 100% support for democracy as a democratic government gives a very large bonus. Advisor bonuses give some if you have them available or by choosing decisions or doing focuses, which also help. Generally, try to keep this as high as possible, as it will dictate how hard it is for the enemy to capitulate your country. War support is the amount of support that the people of a nation have towards any conflicts they may enter into. This is something that actively needs to be thought about, and pushed for, leading to things like the rise of propaganda. It gives you major debuffs if it is low, including a lower mobilization speed, command power loss, surrender limit reduction, as well as causing events that can be disastrous, like strikes. It is the events that you really need to avoid, as they will cost you political power and many other economic bonuses if people refuse to work. If your war support is high, you gain mobilization speed, command power, and attack and defense bonuses on core territories. Your decision menu includes many choices to increase your support in the war and make sure to take them if you can't afford it. The Peace Conference system is where you decide how to deal with the losers of a major conflict. It has gotten some big changes in By Blood alone. When there is more than one nation in the Peace Conference, there will be a score distribution based on war contribution. Contribution is gained through casualties, occupying areas, garrisoning regions, bombing facilities, naval victories, or really anything along those lines. The nations that contributed more to the war will have more score to decide the outcome of the Peace Conference. There are turns that will start with the highest score. They can make demands that are limited in cost to keep things somewhat fair. When they are done, it will go on to the next highest, and so on. This will allow the peace conference to be decided by all the victors, though oftentimes the biggest nation and the highest contributor will get to decide most of it. You are able to puppet countries, change their government's ideologies to yours, take their ships, take their civs as reparations for a period of time, Demilitarize them by destroying military factories, take their resources, add demilitarized zones, lure break countries within the enemy, and of course, take territory for yourself. In order to get the upper hand in these conferences, make sure you're doing whatever you can to contribute to the war while it is ongoing. World Tension is the current state of world affairs, which is based off of major events around the globe. When it gets higher, there are more problems around the globe, as well as more extremism and war. The higher this goes, the more options countries will have to militarize and prepare for existential conflicts. Having world tension low will limit many focuses and options for countries. Any violent actions such as declaring wars, justifying Cassius bellies, sending volunteers, or very extreme focuses such as Anschlussing as Germany, add events added to this score. 
It does slowly go down over time, but this takes quite a while and normally doesn't matter very much. Democratic and non-aligned countries, especially, have many of their diplomatic options locked behind this score. For example, as a democracy, you need at least 50% world tension to send volunteers to active wars. This concludes the political tutorial for Hearts of Iron 4, and is the first part in a larger series. Through these videos, I hope to give you an understanding for the game so that you can play it, as it is simply not easy to learn. In the next tutorial, we will cover the economic aspects before moving on to the big one, military. I hope you enjoyed, and if it was helpful, please leave a like and subscribe. It really helps. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. I'm Hammurabi, thanks for watching.